Now, here's a thought that I had while um, thinking about the how the Nintendo Switch is really being, um, you know, indie developer friendly, and how this is, you know, really good for the indie scene and the, the indie developers uh, as a whole. Um, and I was thinking, could indie developers replace third-party developers? in, uh, you know, making games for consoles. Now, I want to go over uh, reasons why and why this could happen and why it could not happen. Um, why it could happen? Um, well, you have a bunch of, uh, it just makes it easier for just like one person in their mother's basement to get on a computer and just like type up a um, game um, and uh, you know, sell it on the on the Nintendo Switch, and if they're lucky, it'll blow up big, and it, um, it, they make lots of money. Nintendo makes a lot of money, and then they make more games, which will hopefully be as good as the first one, and you know, sell more money and more games and make tons of money. The problem here is, is that unless they uh, um, you know want to hire more people it's just going to be that one person and um, unless they've got like a friend or somebody that they know to um, look over the games and you know they're getting early feedback during the development of the game the game is prob probably isn't going to be as good as if there was multiple people working on it because with one person you, you only have their ideas you only have their view of the game and what it should be with multiple people you have other people to give you ideas that you may not have had and, po and maybe never would have had um, with uh, our work to them and then you also have had with a bigger team um, you have a um, lot faster development time like you know games are completed a lot faster and the games will look a lot nicer now this isn't a really big issue for the Nintendo Switch because um, Nintendo's never been, never ever ever has been about looking the best. I mean, the um, GameCube was the best console of its generation if you're talking about hardware standards. Um, but I think that's the only time they've actually ever been like uh, since since the NES or SNES. Well, since the since I think that's the only time since the 16-bit era they've actually been, um, you know, competitive, well, competitively viable in hardware specs standards. You know what I mean? Um, well, yeah. Back back to the subject on the hand. So, with indie developers, um, they re I really don't think that they could replace um, you know third party developers um, in, as a whole because um, you have the um, thing where um, you will name one indie game that looks that was developed within a reasonable time that looks half as good as Battlefront 2, I know loot boxes and everything, but it is a nice looking game. And that's coming from somebody who doesn't particularly care about graphics. I can I know when a game looks nice and Battlefront 2 did look nice. Um And do you really think that any indie game within a reasonable amount of time of development will ever get to the standard of um you know, Battlefront 2 even if they were developing for the Xbox One or um, PS4. That's something can only an entire team can really do feasibly. Um, but the right something that most people will know about Nintendo is that their relationship with third-party developers has been rough, for to say the least, for quite a while now. It started at, at during the N64 era. Um, while the, the, most people will say, yeah, the N64 was uh, better than the original PlayStation, um, be, uh, thanks to its library of games and, the, um, well, yeah, mostly it was its library of games. Um, 
but um, the thing is that really didn't help with third party developers because um, uh, the N64 stuck with cartridges at, and at that point in time um, the, uh, Sony had a disc based console out and so did um, Dreamcast and I think uh, the original Xbox came out about then, I think it came out when well, I came out during the GameCube era. One of those two. Well, I think, yeah, I think the original Xbox came out during the GameCube era with the PlayStation 2 and everything, and then the 360 came out with the Wii. Anyway, um, so we had uh, two other consoles that had the disc based, uh, um, you know, the ability to use read discs. And um, this is the reason why most consoles still use it now, apart from the Nintendo Switch, as we have here. And the Nintendo Switch doesn't use, um, oh, the Nintendo Switch uses cartridges. Yeah, I have Crash the Insane Trilogy. It uses cartridges because um, if you had, a, it would be stupid to have a handheld reading discs because um, if you, uh, you know, to angle the console wrong, it'll uh, mean that the that the laser has to read the disc even harder. You know, it just basically knackers the um, laser, which is why I'm just like, why did Sony think making a disc-based handheld was good? I don't know how they prevented that from happening. I think they use like Blu-ray technology. I don't know, but they basically um, somehow they managed to stop that from happening. Um, but that's why, um, you know, their con handhelds have always used cartridges. Um, and uh, the, it's uh, and you can just store more data on a disc than you can a cartridge. And that made it really hard for third-party developers because obviously they want to they want to develop their game for the new up-and-coming PlayStation Sony PlayStation because. Um, yeah, that was up and coming, so they wanted to develop for that. But if they wanted to develop a game, a game for that and the N64, it would just be really hard for them because the N, the N cartridges just just didn't uh, couldn't hold as much memory as a disc. So, and they would have to compromise a lot of things. So either the, the choice was cut, limit the game, and it, uh, put it on the Nintendo 64. Or, you know, make the game you want to make and put it on the PlayStation. And yeah, obviously that dampened the relationship with um, third party developers quite a bit. Um, the GameCube, while it is one of my favourite consoles, it, it didn't help. Like, it just did not help at all. Like, uh, most people, you probably know that the um, GameCube discs were smaller discs, like the about the size they put in, uh, so, uh, Sony put in their PSP, um, yeah, about the size of them, I think it might have been a bit bigger, I, don't, I can't, I haven't compared them, but, yeah, um, so the micro discs, but the problem is, while it was better than them sticking with cartridges, um, from a game development standpoint, it, it still wasn't as good as regular discs, and it, um, it just made it not as hard, but still, annoying to uh, um, you know make a game for the GameCube and while bigger companies like Sega did manage to do that because they released Sonic Adventure, Sonic Adventure, well not Sonic Adventure 1, they released Sonic Adventure 2 and Sonic Heroes for the GameCube and it ran better than the PS2 um, on the game yeah. um, but yeah th that pre uh, that really just didn't help their relationship, and they just they, Nintendo's just never really been able to get much third party to support. So I don't know if they've been trying. Maybe they tried and just failed with the Wii or Wii U. I don't know if they tried on the Wii. I, I wasn't. I, I while well, I games for a good few years at that point, I really wasn't like keeping up with news and all that. But yeah, um, the you know what they did is. Uh, so what they're doing now, in my view, is they're focusing on an uh, up to until now an untapped, untapped market, the indie developers, because 
while an indie game could get on the f Xbox One or PS4, they're nowhere near as indie friendly as the Nintendo Switch. So, um, I think they are trying to replace third party developers with indie developers. Now, do I think this could work out for Nintendo in the long run? Yeah, I do think so. Because they already have access to the indie market. Like, we, we have seen like just tons of indie games, whether they're good or bad, you know, we, we, you know, we're seeing just tons of them coming out of it. Um, of two more that are quite good coming that I plan to come over, and uh, there's our Undertale, uh, which was one of the first in Nindies, uh, as they called them, that was announced as planned to come over eventually. So, um, yeah, this could work out for them because, like I said, they already have access to you know they they pretty much automatically had access to this, and there's a lot more indie developers than there are. Um, you know, big companies, so that'll keep game. That'll help keep a steady flow of games coming into the Switch. I mean, there's literally so many games I'm having trouble keeping up with them all. Um, and it, uh, um, yeah, so it it and it, um, I think right. This will work out in the long run because it would. Uh, the time it would take for them to mend the relationship with third party developers well, during that time they could just be making money with uh, indie developers like yeah and like I said this is really good for, and uh, um, the main reason why indie developers want to come over to Switch is because they are finding tremendous success um, on the Switch so uh, the Switch may even um, at, overshadow Steam for uh, you know the you know to, it'll probably be known as the place indie developers go to release their games. Where up until uh, well not not yet but up until if this does happen, it uh, it's it would be regarded as Steam being the place where uh, indie develop indie developers go to release their games. And uh, who knows. Because of this, we might see the next Undertale pop up. I'm um, not literally like Undertale people, but like the next um, cultural indie cultural phenomenon, you know, pop up because it's so easy for um, you know an indie game to get published on Switch. You know that. Um, I think, yeah, and I think because um, the Switch already has, you know, is has sold so well, I think it could legitimately overshadow. Steam in uh, you know deciding you know whether if the game developers are like okay so we could you know develop it for the Switch um, it'd be a bit more complicated but the Switch has sold a lot and it, uh, um, it is one of the best platforms for gaming especially for adults who are busy all the time and they don't have time to sit down in front of a computer or in front of a TV. Um, to play a game, you know, when they're always on the go, so you know, it's good for that. Um, so it could, like I said, potentially overshadow Steam, but if that does happen, we'll see. And if it does, I'll probably make a video that like, I was right, I was right. But now, this, this is just literally just like my best guess of, as what could happen with it. But I do think eventually, you know, the good games will just be, unless Nintendo does something quickly, because I don't think they're really doing anything about this right now, um, there are going to be a lot of game, bad games, you know, just like asset flips coming in, and if they don't do anything about it, they will just bury all the good games, and then it's just like, nobody will really want to buy an indie game, because just that uh, there's just a bunch of it, um, assholes just flipping assets uh, just to make a quick uh, quid so um, so if, if Nintendo was uh, was to you know want to overshadow Steam this is what they would need to do quickly add a rating system I know there was already a rating system that was like being tested out so hopefully that's going to be implemented soon so rating system number one 
Number two. Add a report button to report asset flips. Um, because asset flips just need to, can, should, cannot be on the switch if it wants to succeed. Now the thing is with Steam, asset flips, you know, is it won't be too hard to find it, find asset asset flips on Steam. But if we have a Nintendo Switch e store that is clear of asset flips, then then um, more you know people will be uh, more willing to go to uh, that uh, store and uh, um, you know buy games uh, another thing I need to add uh, a refund system so if you do end up buying an asset flip um, you know and I guess we put and that game you bought gets reported for being an asset flip you it should give you the option to uninstall the game um, to get your money back for it, not force you because there might be people who want to make a video on the game game because it's so funnily stupid or whatever. But you know, just give the people options to get a refund for the game if they do just end up buying a b asset flip. Um, that'll make that'll just erase all worries from consumers' minds that they're just gonna buy an asset flip it's going to be a shitty game not fun and you just wasted uh, your money now I don't know exactly technically how you could get get to that done like maybe a PayPal PayPal like system but then again it's just like they're gonna have to they would have to figure out that that themselves because I I'm not a technical genius here Um. And uh, something else they need to add um, is uh, a free to play section. Like, um, uh, so you go into the eShop and then you go to um, say like customize search options, and then it's like free to play, and then it comes up with every game that you can play for free. Because um, yeah, I know it has a thing for free demo, but not you know free to play. Like not you can download the full game and just play it. Um, I think it needs that. I I don't know if it. I don't think it does have that. If it does, then yeah. But I don't think it has that right now. Um, so yeah. So long story short, could indies replace third party developers? No, not really, because you know. They just can't make as big games as a third party developer can. Um, but um, if uh, Nintendo adds a rating system and a asset flip removal system, then I think this could work out extremely lucrative for Nintendo. Anyway, uh, I may be streaming a bit later, shortly after this video goes up, and um, I'll be having another go at. Um, Happy Stance Island in Pokemon Quest to see if I can beat my um, record set uh, because I've got a few things I want to show off. So if you're watching this today of upload, you know, stay tuned for the live stream later. Uh, bye bye.